Hello there! Would you by any chance be interested in seeing a really ugly mathematical proof? Now, I hope your answer is yes, but if your answer is for some reason no, then please humor me for a bit. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. The proof that I'm going to show you involves sines and cosines, and if you don't like trigonometry, you shouldn't feel too bad about it. After all, this first part of the video is meant to be painful to watch anyway. And if you don't even know what sine and cosine is, then don't you worry about a thing. I'll make sure that you can suffer along with the rest of us just fine. Let's begin by establishing some basic terminology. If we draw the unit circle in the plane, and draw a line segment from the origin to a point P on the circle that makes out an angle theta together with a positive x-axis, then the x-coordinate of P is called the cosine of theta, and the y-coordinate of P is called the sine of theta. Now to the problem at hand. Suppose that we know the sine and cosine of the angles phi and theta, which is the same as saying that we know the coordinates of the points P and Q on the screen. How can we then figure out the sine and the cosine of the angle sum phi plus theta, or if we think more geometrically, the coordinates of the point R on the screen? Granted, this problem is of course not among the hardest problems in all of mathematics, but it's still far from easy. In fact, if you don't know what the answer is beforehand, you're probably not going to figure it out very quickly. And now to the ugly proof that I promised earlier. We're going to prove that the cosine and sine of phi plus theta are given by the following two formulas. Firstly, the cosine of phi plus theta is equal to the cosine of phi times the cosine of theta minus the sine of phi times the sine of theta. And secondly, the sine of phi plus theta is equal to the cosine of phi times the sine of theta plus the sine of phi times the cosine of theta. To do this, we begin by proving that the cosine of phi minus theta is equal to cosine of phi times the cosine of theta plus the sine of phi times the sine of theta. And if you wonder if there's a typo here, don't worry, everything is going exactly according to plan. We prove the difference formula by drawing the picture from the original problem statement. And we begin by drawing a line segment between the points P and Q. Then we create a copy of this line segment and slide it along the circle until the point that was originally at P is now at the intersection point A between the unit circle and the positive x-axis with coordinates 1 and 0. The end point of the shifted line segment is then at a point B and since the angle the points P and Q make out with the origin is phi minus theta, then it follows that B has coordinates cosine of phi minus theta and sine of phi minus theta. Since the lengths of the original line segment and its shifted copy are the same, we realize that the distance between P and Q is equal to the distance between A and B. Using the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the square of the distance between P and Q, we find that it's equal to the square of cosine of phi minus cosine of theta plus the square of sine of phi minus sine of theta. And using the squaring rule for real numbers together with the Pythagorean identity for sines and cosines, we find that this expression simplifies to 2 minus 2 times cosine of phi times cosine of theta plus sine of phi times sine of theta. Likewise, we find that the square of the distance between A and B simplifies to 2 minus 2 times cosine of phi minus theta. Since these expressions must be equal, it follows that cosine of phi minus theta is equal to cosine of phi times cosine of theta plus sine of phi times sine of theta, which proves the difference formula for cosine. Using this formula together with the symmetries cosine of minus alpha is equal to cosine of alpha, and sine of minus alpha is equal to minus sine of alpha, we see that cosine of phi plus theta is equal to cosine of phi minus minus theta, which by the difference formula for cosine is equal to cosine of phi times cosine of minus theta plus sine of phi times sine of minus theta. But this is just equal to cosine of phi times cosine of theta minus sine of phi times sine of theta, just like we wanted. To get the addition formula for sine, 
we use the identities cosine of alpha is equal to sine of pi over 2 minus alpha and sine of alpha is equal to cosine of pi over 2 minus alpha. Then we have that sine of phi plus theta is equal to cosine of pi over 2 minus phi plus theta. And this is just equal to cosine of pi over 2 minus phi minus theta. And now we can use the difference formula for cosine to see that this is equal to cosine of pi over 2 minus phi times cosine of theta plus sine of pi over 2 minus phi times sine of theta, which is of course just equal to sine of phi times cosine of theta plus cosine of phi times sine of theta, which completes the proof. Whew. Now that we've endured this torture session together, let's talk about why I showed you this proof in the first place. The reason is actually very simple. This is the proof of these formulas that I was shown when I learned about trigonometry back in high school, as well as when we went over the same formulas at university. And while I'm not sure how things look in other parts of the world, in my home country Sweden, after some searches online, this seems to be the standard way to prove these identities in many countries around the world. But this is pretty strange. After all, this proof uses some rather ad hoc methods and identities, seemingly pulled out of thin air with no explanation, and then it just happens to work out in the end. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that even though this proof is valid, it doesn't give us a way to understand why the addition formulas are true on a more intuitive level. Alexander Gotendik, one of the most influential mathematicians of the 20th century, once said the following, One should never try to prove anything that's not almost obvious. This might seem like a strange quote. Why shouldn't we try to prove surprising results? But this is perhaps missing the point of the statement. If we consider the given proof of the trig identities we just saw, it's hard to argue that the proof made any of these identities even slightly more intuitively clear. So students learning this for the first time just have to resign themselves to memorizing the formulas and pray to higher powers or something that they should not forget them in a time of need. This gives us a bit more insight into Grotendieck's statement. Even though the quote seems a bit strange at first glance, it only talks about proofs, not about discovery. So, if we interpret the quote with this in mind, a new idea slowly creeps forward. If a proof doesn't make the statement any easier to understand, then we should look for a better proof. And there is, in fact, a proof of these trig identities that actually make them almost trivially true in some sense, completely in line with Gotendieck's remark. But there is a major catch, which explains why it's not used in textbooks very often. The proof uses these things called vectors. Although the final goal is to give a beautiful proof of the addition formulas for sine and cosine, the main focus of this video is going to be explaining vectors in two dimensions. If you already feel comfortable working with these vectors and just want to see what in my opinion is the superior way to prove the trig identities, then feel free to skip ahead to the final section of this video. Otherwise, if you don't know what vectors are, then stick around while I'll explain everything we need to know about them for now. If you've heard about vectors before in applied contexts such as programming and physics, you may have heard vectors described as ordered list of numbers or as arrows with a length and a direction. And these are common types of vectors that come up all the time in practice, and we'll even see them come up later in this video. But for now, I'd like to describe vectors in the following more general way. In short, vectors are objects that we can add together or scale by a real number to create new objects of the same kind. And that's it. If u and v are vectors of the same kind, then so are 2 times u, 1 half times v, u plus v, and any other object that we can generate from u and v using addition and scaling. This definition might seem a bit simplistic, but the simplicity means that we can think of many different mathematical objects as vectors as long as we can figure out a good way to add and scale them. For instance, 
Real numbers can be thought of as vectors, since we can add two real numbers together and get another real number, and we can scale real numbers by multiplying them with another real number. But why is this useful? Sure, this example is good to highlight that vectors actually occur naturally in mathematics we already know, but it doesn't really justify inventing an entirely new concept of vectors just so we can parade it around. And it certainly doesn't give us anything to work with when it comes to the addition formulas for sine and cosine. To get where we want in the end, we'll focus on two-dimensional vectors specifically, or vectors in 2D space as they're also sometimes called. Two-dimensional vectors can be described in two different ways. First, the algebraic way, using ordered pairs of real numbers arranged in a column, and secondly, the geometric way, where vectors are described as arrows in the plane. At this point, it's not really clear what we're doing, and there are some questions that need answering. Firstly, why do we even have two different ways to describe two-dimensional vectors? And secondly, how can we add and scale columns and arrows? If we begin with the first question, the answer has a lot to do with what we actually use vectors for in practice. As we'll see, doing calculations with vectors described algebraically is pretty easy, and using the geometric description of vectors gives us an elegant way to treat many problems which can be stated geometrically using vectors. The second question is a bit more involved than the first one, and it's a lot easier to deal with if we look at the algebraic side of things first. Given a column V, with entries A and B, we begin by establishing some common language to talk about it. Firstly, a vector written in this way is often called a column vector. Yes, I know, mathematicians are certainly an imaginative bunch. Secondly, we call the upper entry, which is A in this case, the x-coordinate of B, and we call the lower entry, which is B in this case, the y-coordinate of B. While this naming convention seems a bit unfounded at the moment, I can assure you that there is a very natural reason why they are called this. Now, given two column vectors AB and CD, how do we define addition and scaling by real numbers? While it's fun to let our imaginations run wild and try to invent some crazy ways to do this, sometimes it's better to keep things as simple as possible. So we define addition in the following way. The vectors a, b, and c, d are added together to make up the vector with x-coordinate a plus c and the y-coordinate b plus d. That is, addition is done coordinate-wise. Scaling is also done coordinate-wise, meaning that k times the column vector a, b is equal to the vector with x-coordinate k times a and y-coordinate k times b. As it turns out, this way to define addition and scaling of column vectors makes it very easy to do calculations with them, since the basic algebra is very similar to that of real numbers. This is because of the following. Firstly, addition and scaling are well behaved. By this I simply mean that u plus v is equal to v plus u, and that the expressions u plus v plus w and k1 times k2 times v make perfect sense without any need to be careful when writing them down. Secondly, subtraction of vectors makes sense. This is because there is a vector, which we call the zero vector, defined as the vector whose x-coordinate and y-coordinate are both zero. This vector is neutral with respect to addition, meaning that for any vector v, v plus the zero vector is equal to v once again. Moreover, we have that v plus minus 1 times v is always equal to the zero vector, no matter which vector v we choose, which gives us a natural way to define subtraction as vector u minus vector v is just equal to u plus minus 1 times v. Finally, addition and scaling are compatible in the expected way, that is, a times v plus b times v is always equal to a plus b times v, and a times the sum u plus v is always equal to a times u plus a times v. Now, if you don't have the time or energy to memorize this list of properties with regards to addition and scaling, don't worry, they're just technical properties that mathematicians tend to whine about if we don't check them. 
The important thing for us is that when we do calculations with column vectors, we can use our intuition from algebra with real numbers to manipulate the expressions without weird things happening. There is one more thing worth exploring before moving on now that we have addition and scaling of row vectors. Consider the vector v with coordinates a and b. This vector can be rewritten as a times the vector with coordinates 1 and 0, plus b times the vector with coordinates 0 and 1. If we call the vector with coordinates 1 and 0 for x, and the second vector with the coordinates 0 and 1 for y, then v can be written as the sum a times x plus b times y, where a is the x-coordinate of v and b is the y-coordinate. This means that every two-dimensional column vector can be written as the sum of the two vectors x and y. These vectors will come into play later on, but for now we just keep in mind that every two-dimensional column vector can be decomposed in this way. Now that we have explained how addition and scaling works for two-dimensional vectors described algebraically, it's high time to talk about geometric vectors. You know, the arrows in the plane. Before getting ahead of ourselves though, we need to note something important. When we talk about geometric vectors as arrows in the plane, we think of them as having no set position. That is, if we want to call the arrow on the screen a vector v, then it remains the same vector no matter where it's moved in the plane. If you've never seen this before, it might seem a bit strange and arbitrary, but it makes life easier for us in many ways. After all, we want these arrows to be vectors, meaning that we must find a good way to add and scale them. But how should we do that? This question has no immediately obvious answer. However, if we think of the arrows as having no set position, there is a clever way of using the addition and scaling that we already have for column vectors to figure out how to do it for geometric vectors as well. So, how do we use the addition and scaling of row vectors to define addition and scaling of arrows? The answer is simple, we just create a two-way dictionary. Because, if we have a two-way dictionary between algebraic and geometric vectors, we can translate our geometric vectors to their algebraic counterparts, then add the resulting column vectors, and then we translate the result back to the geometric side of things and just define the result as the sum that we're after to begin with. This method to define addition and scaling in the geometric setting using what we've already done in the algebraic setting is absolutely brilliant, because we don't even have to check to make sure that geometric addition and scaling defined this way behave nicely, since we already checked that on the algebraic side of things. But all of this requires the following. For every geometric vector, there must be exactly one algebraic vector it is translated to, and vice versa. That is, the dictionary has to be one to one. Otherwise, if we try to use this method when there are, for instance, two geometric translations of the same algebraic vector that just happens to be the sum we're interested in, then there is no good way to just choose one of them as the true sum that we're after. And this is the real reason why we consider geometric vectors as arrows in the plane without a position. If we do this the right way, then we can create the one-to-one -one dictionary that we need. So let's get to work. As is almost always the case, we begin by going over some conventions used when dealing with the plane. Going forward, the plane will be equipped with a quadratic grid with grid lines going in the horizontal and the vertical directions. This grid is used to determine distance and direction in the plane. We say that the distance between two neighboring intersection points in the grid is equal to one unit length, and we use the convention that the right direction in the grid is called the positive x direction, and the up direction is called the positive y direction. The left and down directions are called the negative x and y directions, respectively. Now, given a row vector v with x coordinate a and y coordinate b, we can choose any point P in the plane as a starting point for the geometric translation of V. Then we move A units in the X direction and B units in the Y direction, arriving at a point Q. The arrow starting at P and ending in Q is then the geometric translation of the given row vector. 
That is, it's the geometric vector that gets identified with V. One may wonder what happens if we choose a different starting point, say P prime. And the answer is that the only thing that differentiates the resulting arrow from the original is its position. Both the original and the new arrow will have the same length and direction in the plane, meaning that they can be moved to perfectly overlap. And this is the way we formalize the notion of arrows not having a preferred position. It simply means that two arrows in the plane are said to be the same geometric vector if they can be moved in the plane to perfectly overlap with one another. Wow, so many words used to explain so little. We'd better get moving. Going from a geometric vector v in the plane to its column vector translation is not very difficult. We just use the grid and any starting point of v and determine how far we have to go in the x and y directions respectively to reach the end point of v. That is, if we have to walk a distance of a units in the x direction and a distance of b units in the y direction to reach the end point, then the column vector that v is translated to is the column with x coordinate a and y coordinate b. With this, we finally have a one-to-one -one dictionary between the algebraic and geometric descriptions of vectors. So let's do some translations of what we already know on the algebraic side. Starting out with the simple stuff, let's consider what the geometric versions of the x, the y and the zero vector look like. Unsurprisingly, the x vector points in the positive x direction and its length is one unit. Likewise, the y vector points in the positive y direction and its length is also one unit. The zero vector is not much for show, and with a length of zero we may view it as a single point in the plane if we really want a visual representation of it. Moving on to scaling, if v is a geometric vector, then k times v is an arrow parallel to v that is k times as long. If k is positive, then k times v points in the same direction as v, and if k is negative, then k times v points in the opposite direction of v. Before going over sums of general vectors, let's consider the decomposition of column vectors that I mentioned a while back. As I stated back then, every two-dimensional vector v can be decomposed as the sum a times x plus b times y, where a and b are the x and y coordinates of v, respectively. If we consider what this looks like in the geometric setting, we see that starting at an arbitrary point in the plane, we can reach the endpoint of V in different ways. Firstly, we can walk along V until we reach its endpoint, or we can begin by walking along A times X and then walk along B times Y until the endpoint is reached. In both cases, we reach the same endpoint which means that v makes out a triangle with the vectors a times x and b times y. Alternatively, we can begin by walking along b times y and then walk along a times x until we reach the end point. Once again, the same point is reached as when we just walk along v, giving us an interpretation of v as a diagonal of the rectangle with sides a times x and b times y. This way of thinking about addition works for geometric vectors in general. If u and v are arbitrary vectors, then their sum is found by first walking along u and then walking along v until the endpoint is reached. The sum u plus v is then the vector going from the starting point of u to the endpoint of v, making out a triangle with u and v. Once again, it doesn't matter whether we begin with u or v, and we can just as well begin by walking along v and then walk along u to reach the same endpoint. A nice way for us to think about it is to draw out u and v from the same starting point, say p, and then draw a copy of u starting at the end of v and draw a copy of v starting at the end of u, with the copies reaching the same endpoint q. Then the sum u plus v is the diagonal of this parallelogram we just drew going from the common starting point P to the common endpoint Q. Keep this in mind, as we'll use it later. In general, as we expand our dictionary with more and more concepts, vectors get increasingly powerful as a mathematical tool. 
So far, we have only filled in the dictionary by first defining a concept in the algebraic setting and then translating it to the geometric setting. But the fact is that we can go in the other direction as well, defining a concept in the geometric setting and then translating it to the algebraic setting. In this video we'll have time to go over one such concept, which at the surface level seems purely geometric without any clear connection to algebra, and that concept is rotations. With the geometric description of vectors, we know exactly what we mean by rotating them purely based on intuition, and now the goal is to try and figure out what this looks like in the algebraic setting. Before we can do that, we need to look a bit closer at exactly how rotations of two-dimensional vectors actually behave in the geometric setting. We note a few interesting properties of this rotation. First off, we note that if v is a vector and k is a real constant, then first scaling v by k, followed by rotating the result, gives us the same vector in the end as if we first rotate v and then scale the result by k. In other words, the rotation of k times v is equal to k times the rotation of v. Secondly, if u and v are vectors, then the rotation of u plus v is actually equal to the sum of the rotation of u and the rotation of v individually. To see this, let us call the sum u plus v by the name w. By rotating the entire parallelogram that gives a geometric description of w, we see that the parallelogram is not deformed in any way by the rotation. So w is rotated just as much as the sides u and v. Moreover, we see that the rotation of W is the sum of the rotation of U and the rotation of V by the geometric view of sums of vectors. Hence, we have that the rotation of W, which is just the rotation of U plus V, is equal to the rotation of U plus the rotation of V, as we initially claimed. The above properties are often summarized by saying that rotations in the plane are linear, that is, rotations respect the structure of our space of two-dimensional vectors, and we can summarize this into the following compact formula. The rotation of a times u plus b times v is equal to a times the rotation of u plus b times the rotation of v. The fact that rotations are actually linear is a huge help when we want to describe them algebraically, and that is because of the decomposition of a vector into its x and y components that we talked about earlier. If we can just figure out what happens when we rotate the x and y vectors by an angle theta, then we can use the linearity to figure out what happens to any vector v when we rotate it by the same angle, since the rotation of v is just equal to a times the rotation of x plus b times the rotation of y, where a and b are the x and y coordinates of v. To figure out how the x and y vectors are rotated, we begin by drawing the unit circle centered at the origin. The rotation of x is more or less automatically given by the definition of sine and cosine as cosine of theta times the x vector plus sine of theta times the y vector, but rotating the y vector by the same angle is not as immediately obvious. However, if we consider the symmetries of the circle, we note that the x coordinate of the rotation of y must have the same magnitude as the y coordinate of the rotation of x. We also note that these coordinates must have different signs, and hence we get that the x-coordinate of the rotation of y is minus sine of theta. Likewise, the y-coordinate of the rotation of y can be seen to be equal to the x-coordinate of the rotation of x, meaning that it's equal to cosine of theta. In summary, we have that the rotation of the y vector is equal to minus sine of theta times the x vector plus cosine of theta times the y vector. Now we get the algebraic description of the rotation of an arbitrary vector as follows by using all of what we've gone over so far. And there we have it, an algebraic formula for rotations of two-dimensional vectors. With this, 
we have everything we need and we can finally go over that beautiful proof that I wanted to show you all along. To fully understand the addition formulas for sine and cosine, it's helpful to go back to the geometric description of rotations in the plane. I'll begin by pointing out the following rather obvious geometric fact. Rotating x by the angle sum phi plus theta is the same as first rotating it by the angle phi and then rotating the result by the angle theta. If it helps, we can even write this assertion down in equation form. And that's basically it. The addition formulas for sine and cosine are just the algebraic translation of this self-evident geometric statement, as can be seen by expanding both sides of this equation using the algebraic formula for rotation. Now that's what I call a proof. Of course, there is so much more to explore when it comes to vectors, but I just felt like this particular way to prove these formulas for sine and cosine is too nice to ignore. The idea of using a dictionary between seemingly different mathematical domains is a truly powerful one, and mathematicians use it all the time. But normally, I feel like the idea is gatekept behind math subjects that are way too advanced for people outside of STEM to even get a chance to appreciate fully. And I think that's a damn shame. There is so much beauty in the methods we use to prove different mathematical statements. And when it comes to education systems all around the world, it seems to me like most people care more about the amazing results rather than the truly wonderful paths we can walk down to gain new mathematical insight. And I know, this video is already long enough without me sitting here rambling about why I made it in the first place. So I'll end it here by just saying thank you so much for watching. I really hope it was worth your while.